Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the next. And I mean, it's so wonderful how this stuff is coming out, like regularly and predictably and completely. The George Lloyd edition on Nimbus. It's fabulous. What Lyrita, pardon me. It's distributed by Nimbus. It's on Lyrita. Uh, the violin and cello concertos. Now, these are not conducted by Lloyd, actually, because they were recorded rather later in the game. Um, they have, let's see, the violin concertos are with the Philharmonia, conducted by David Perry, featuring Christina Angelescu violin. They're very good soloists. She's an excellent violinist. And the cello concerto, which is all by itself on disc two, is Anthony Ross, cello with the Albany Symphony, under David Allen Miller. Now, these are lovely works. They are late works for Lloyd. Um, the violin concertos are from 1970 and 1977. And the cello concerto, gee, it doesn't even give a date. 1997. There we go. It's here. Um, it's just a year before his death, at the age of 85. And it's a beautiful work. You know, Elgar wrote his, his cello concerto at the end of his life, too, and it's supposed to be a very valedictory piece. I like this one better. <laughs> a lot better. I think it's livelier and more healthy and charming, and it's not all full of weepy nostalgia. Well, anyway, that's that's me. I mean, I don't all the Elgarians, please don't go crazy on me. That's just a personal thing. But, you know, the violin concertos teach us something very, very important about the kind of composer that Lloyd was, because violin concertos are atrociously difficult to write. They're difficult to write because violin technique is a personal thing personal to each violinist, to a degree anyway, and also because the problems of balance in violin concertos are legion, legendary, and that's why so many composers only wrote one of them. And when they did write it, they wound up revising it and fixing it, and once you find a virtuoso who's willing to play it, and then they revise it and diddle it, and oh, they're just, it's such a pain in the ass, it really is. But Lloyd was a violinist. That was his instrument. And so he really knew what he was doing when it came to writing these two works. One of them is for violin and winds, and the other is for violin and strings. So in each case, he's come up with a, an orchestration that really uh, serves to offset the violin, the solo violin, without incurring problems of you know drowning it out and overwhelming it and whatnot. The first concerto for violin and winds is an absolutely lovely work that would be marvelous um, for a wind ensemble. I mean, wind ensembles need pieces like concerto pieces. I mean, that would be really nice in a program of music for wind band. And I mean, a violin concerto where you have the wind ensemble is really a nice idea for a concert program, but it means that the piece is never going to have a normal life in the symphonic concert hall. I mean, really? I mean, like Court Viol's violin concerto is also for violin and winds. I mean, there's a bunch of those in the modern repertoire, but most of them are kind of spiky and unappealing, whereas this one is really fun. And the, the second one for violin and strings is a beautiful work for chamber orchestras, chamber orchestras that do Vivaldi concerti or Baroque concerti, which are all for violin and strings. It's really, it's really smart of Lloyd, I think, to arrange them this way because it solves the balance problem and also creates a useful repertoire niche. Not that anyone has paid any attention to that repertoire niche. But when you look at the major composers, Shostakovich, for example, when he wrote his string concerti, they're all for small orchestra. It's cello concerti too. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the only brass is a pair of horns and, and woodwind strings and a tiny bit of percussion maybe. You know, that's the way he did it. He doesn't have this huge kazanga orchestra that the violin is trying to, to offset. I mean, there are many creative ways to solve that balance problem. You know, Sibelius did it by writing an orchestral part that never rises above middle C. You know, I mean, it's the violin is on top of it all the time, even though the orchestra has trombones. You, you know, they're, they only are reserved for the big, powerful climaxes. And just to illustrate how crazy this is, it's not a violin concerto, but this is a true story. Um, in my own, in my own uh, education as a classical music type person, I had a friend. Um, his name was Pierre Bourdain, a very, very nice man, um, who ran along with his colleague from DECA. He was from so many, from Columbia at that time, and his colleague from DECA was Remy Farkas, and they ran Orpheus Remarkable Recordings up on Lexington Avenue. And Pierre was quite friendly, he was French, with Jean-Pierre Rampal. And he told me that Rampal was giving the premiere of Ezra Laterman's Flute Concerto at Carnegie Hall, and he, and he asked me if I would go with him. 
And I said, sure, I'd love to go. We could go backstage afterwards and meet Ron Paul, and it would be lovely and terrific. So we went. And we're sitting there, and this huge orchestra is assembled with lots of brass and percussion and whatnot. And there's poor old Jean-Pierre with his flute. And I said to Pierre, watch this. The brass are going to have mutes on for the whole piece. And sure enough, they practically did. It was a crazy, Ill, ill-written, a melodic piece with a lovely central movement that was a homage and homage to Judith Blagan, who had passed away, the wonderful soprano who sings, you know, Mahler Four for George Sell, and and that was lovely. Except except Laterman's great idea was that at the climax to have the 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 accompaniment come back without the tune. I mean, and it's a flute concerto, so. You, you, you see where we're going here, folks? So after that thing was over, we went backstage. And uh, I don't remember what else was on the program, but it was that. And we went backstage to meet Ron Paul, who was standing there, and Laterman was there. And you know, the composer, and he was a serious guy, and he meant well. I mean, he's not, he's not untalented his music. I heard a few works of his as part of the, you know, academic, you know, serialist, you know, people of the day. Um, certain, I've heard he wrote a concerto for orchestra, I think, that I heard, and some other things. Anyway, none of it was terribly appealing. And, and Laterman was there, and of course his friends were there telling him, oh, Ezra, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. It was sublime. It was wonderful. And Ron Paul looks at me after we were introduced and said, what did you think? And I sort of grimaced. I went, yeah, like this. And he looks at me and he says, entre nous, je ne l'aime pas. You know, between us, I don't like it either. Um, but, you know, it was written for him, so of course he played it. All of which goes to show that there are major, when, when composers take their jobs seriously and think about them musically, they come up with creative solutions. And writing violin concertos or cello concertos, you know, with a single melody instrument against the whole panoply of the modern orchestra, they usually get smart in terms of the way they arrange it. Even Bernstein. You know, look at Bernstein. Bernstein has standard concerto orchestration. It was strings, harp, and percussion. The serenade after Plato's symposium, you know, Halliel for flute and all those pieces he wrote for, you know, the, the three meditations for mass. It's strings, harp, and percussion because he knew that that ensemble had the color and the sonority he wanted, but he could, he could use it confidently and fully without drowning out the soloist. And that's exactly what Lloyd does. This is a long way of talking about George Lloyd. Um, and and, and I, I say this because I, I really do urge that you listen to these pieces and think about what the musical issues are, the creative challenges in writing works like this. Lloyd understood them. He was a real composer, a thoughtful composer, and he wrote beautiful, beautiful music. Um, and these three string concertos are marvelous. And I hope you'll enjoy them as much as I do. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.